You know, there's a reason that for 56 years, Warren Buffett, the very first page of his annual report for Berkshire Hathaway, every year publishes three numbers. It's the change in book value, the change in the share price, the annual change in the share price, and the annual change in the S&P 500. Those are the three numbers he publishes. And Buffett says the number itself is not that important, but over time, the change in book value will give you a very good indication of the change in intrinsic value, and the change in intrinsic value is what you're aiming for as a loan. You're listening to the Profit by Design podcast, episode 41. You work hard in your business. On the Profit by Design podcast, we ask the big question, what has your business done for you lately? Hi, I'm Dr. Sabrina Starling, the business psychologist, the author of How to Hire the Best, and your co-host on the Profit by Design podcast. Weekly, my co-host, Mike Bruno, and I bring you tips, tools, and strategies from our own experiences and from the experiences of our guests, who are entrepreneurial thought leaders and real-life entrepreneurs, all to support you in making intentionally profitable and sustainable business decisions to live the lifestyle you desire. Hey, Profit Designers, June is vacation month. I hope you are getting some time away to relax, to enjoy your family, get outside, have a barbecue. If you get the opportunity, go to the beach. And in celebration of vacation month, we are doing a special savings on the Breakthroughs on the Bayou four-week vacation legacy retreat. As I'm recording this, which is May, we only have 10 spots left at the retreat. And we're doing a special savings in the month of June. If you register for the retreat in the month of June and you mention, I want a vacation, then we will give you a savings on your registration. The early bird pricing is $8,997, but if you register in June, you get in for $59.97. You'll save $3,000 on your retreat registration. So, four-week vacation legacy retreat happening March 2020. We want to support you in creating a business that runs without you so that you can have more life. I hope you join us. Check us out at fourweekvacation.com. Profit Designers, I'm honored to be able to bring you this episode today where I got to interview Sir Stephen Wilkinson. I've been getting to know Sir Stephen over the last year, and he's actually going to be our VIP speaker at the 2020 Breakthroughs on the Bayou four-week vacation legacy retreat. Sir Stephen has a very interesting background, and I'll be sharing his bio with you shortly, but I want to just let you know what he's really opened my eyes to is that there is a new role that we should be adding to our org charts, and that is the role of investor. And that's what he's going to be sharing with us at the retreat, and he's going to give you a glimpse of that today in our interview. So with that, let me read you his bio. Sir Stephen Wilkinson started early to deal with corporate finance issues. He comes from a middle-class English entrepreneurial family. Through the IPO of the family business in the 60s, his investment training with Merrill Lynch and the years of work in one of the most prestigious asset managers in Germany, he has extensive knowledge of the world of high finance, both theoretically sound as well as practically tested. But that is only one side of the coin. Due to his humanistic image of mankind, and his strong value orientation, he made his interest in a good corporate governance, also known as servant leadership, his second passion many years ago. Stephen Wilkinson co-founded the network of small giants companies as the only European. He has been involved with the Ashoka Organization for the Successful Development of Social Enterprises for more than 15 years and gives his knowledge through lectures and blog articles. He's the moderator of the podcasts Good and Prosper and founder of the internet publishing house of the same name, which prepares and makes accessible knowledge about servant leadership for entrepreneurs. His very rare combination of insider knowledge from the world of high finance and the passion for value-oriented corporate management of small and medium-sized companies, coupled with a decided ability to communicate 
complex knowledge easily and entertainingly gives his students and clients a new perspective on the development of your company and thus contributes to a better culture in the company and a more self-determined life and prosperity for the entrepreneur. So with that, let's dive into the conversation with Sir Stephen. So I think, Stephen, what we're going to start with is I want to hear about what's inspired you lately, because as we were starting our conversation before the recording, you told me about two really good podcast interviews that have inspired you. So let's start there. Yeah. The, um, I think the first one we talked about was your recent conversation. With John, is it? With John Bates. With John Bates, who was your VIP guest last four-week vacation retreat. I thought he was amazing. I think I told you when we were talking, I had to lie down afterwards. He was, there was so much energy being pulsed out of, the, out of my podcast. It was, it was fantastic. And I loved his comment to your listeners and to you that, that they needn't worry because he'd, or any mistakes that they'd made, he'd made at least double or triple the number of mistakes that they've made and the history of making mistakes and learning from them was an integral part of his journey. And I thought that was very humble, it was very funny, and it's very true. You know, we're all standing on a great pile of our own mistakes. And the higher you get, the larger that pile is. I think that's a quote right there. We're all standing on our own pile of mistakes and my pile is really high. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And then you went into that and you were telling me about your experience listening to Elizabeth Gilbert and Oprah. That Because we were talking about being passionate and I think you asked me what my why was and what the passion was. And I, I've been thinking very hard about this whole question of passion because it surrounds us and there are so many invocations that you have to find your passion and you and I'm never really sure whether I've what mine is because I've got lots of things that I'm interested in I was moved greatly by listening to Elizabeth Gilbert talking to Oprah on Super Soul Sunday podcasts um, which I was listening to on Friday evening when I got into Detroit and Elizabeth Gilbert was telling the story of how a woman had spoken to her after one of her passion speeches and saying with great sadness that, that she felt even worse after listening to Elizabeth Gilbert talk about finding your passion and the fire inside. Because she said, you know, I'm at that stage in life where I'm sort of more in the second half of the middle than I am at the beginning, and I just don't have one. And it makes me feel inadequate and deeply sad because I feel I ought to have one and I'm being told that I should have one, and I haven't. And I just haven't. I don't, and if it is, it's not... It hasn't told me what it is, and it makes me sad and f inadequate, and I feel like a failure because I don't have one. And Elizabeth Gilbert said that stopped her in her tracks, and the rest of her talk with Oprah was about how she has completely revised her thinking around passion because she says, I was turning into a passion bully, and most of the people that she has in her life, she's thinking about them, looking at them, they don't have it either. So there are very few people who actually know precisely what their passion is. And telling people they have to have one when they don't is forcing them into this sense of inadequacy, which is nonsense. And it's a path to great unhappiness. So she's reframed her entire message on the back of that one response from the woman to one of curiosity. And following your curiosity, she uses the image of a hummingbird going from flower to flower, finding their way without any particular sense of, without any order, just going where their curiosity or where their taste takes them. And she says, and if you do that and you love life and you're open to life, then maybe at some stage your curiosity will take you to something that becomes your passion. But if it doesn't, it's okay. And that resonated very deeply with me because embedded in that question that you ask, what's your why, why are you doing this, is an invitation to start talking about passion. What's my passion? What moves me so much that I want to do this? And I would, if, I mean, I can answer that question, but I will answer it in a way that doesn't involve the word passion because that would feel disingenuous 
And I'm not, this isn't something that I feel absolutely passionate about. I'm really interested in it. It's an offer to share my experience. Passion has messianic, the prophets of ancient, the Old Testament were passionate. And I'm not prophesying. I'm not, I don't have a claim on the ultimate truth, but I do have an experience and lots of mistakes and great curiosity and inkling of a system which appears to work sometimes and gives what I think is the most important thing that anybody who is teaching and by teaching, we're all teachers, all the people that you get on your podcast, they're all teaching something. They've all got some experience that they want to share. And the most important thing that a teacher can give is context, is allowing, giving people a framework, a new way of looking at things into which they can sort their daily experience to say, oh, I get it. Ah, that makes sense. Now I understand. And then they can start adapting and adopting it for their own purposes. So that's the best answer you're going to get from me as far as passion. And I love this because I think I definitely relate to curiosity, like the way the twists and turns that I've taken in my own personal journey and my business journey are because I'm curious. I am so curious about what is it going to take to help business owners have a better quality of life as they're building their business. And that's led me to different things that I've incorporated in our offering. And I love the curiosity because it is a mindset. And when we were talking prior to recording, you mentioned how do we go through life and maintain that curiosity and that non-judgment. I have a five-year-old daughter, and right now we have an outbreak of monarch butterflies everywhere around our house, and she's fascinated. She's probably not going to develop a passion in her life for monarch butterflies, but she's curious, and if I can nurture that curiosity, and that's how we learn throughout life is following our curiosity like that hummingbird. Do you have lilac bushes in your garden? We have all kinds of butterfly attracting bushes and things. This house was, the landscaping was done by the previous owner who was a bird lover, a butterfly nature lover. So we have all kinds of perennials that come up that attract butterflies. But this year is the first year that we've really seen. We had butterfly bushes that were totally eaten up by the caterpillars from the monarch butterfly. I mean, there's just, the caterpillars were hanging on the leaves. And now a week later, everywhere we look around the house, we have these little cocoons for the chrysalises that'll turn into the cocoons. They're hanging from all the eaves everywhere. It's So anyway, I think we just need to go through life and be curious. I love that. So your curiosity is about how to help business owners fall in love with their balance sheets. Yep. And if I may, I will very, very quickly tell you how I got there. I'm, Please. I'm a linguist. As a child, as a young man, as a student, I, literature and language were what I was fascinated by. I've always written poetry. I've always been fascinated by language. And it is to this day a a mystery to my parents how I ended up in finance. One of the great great unknown questions that um, the universe has posed them. Why on earth their poetic, philosophical son ended up in finance? And I can't really answer that question other than that was the first job that I was offered. And my father had said to me, it doesn't matter what you do, but whatever you do decide to do, master it. And because I felt so hopelessly inadequate in the world of finance and numbers, I decided, okay, I'm going to do, give it my best shot. And I realized something really early on, and that is that numbers are a language. And in business, they just tell a story. And I love stories. So for me, reading annual reports, which was what I was doing when I first started out in finance, and which I do now on a daily basis, is their storybooks. 
And business is one of the very few places where you know, things are happening all the time. And it's people, people doing stuff, making decisions, being ambitious, failing, succeeding, organizing other people, having battles, losing. I mean, it's just great. There's lots of drama. It's in always drama. You know? yes. Not always Shakespearean, but it's drama. And it's drama and the numbers tell the story. And the balance sheet is the repository of all the stories. It's the history of the company. And every single decision that's ever been made, every decision to invest in something, to write it off, to build it up, to go different, everyone is like a layer of information within the balance sheet. And it just builds up over time, compounding away. And that's, if you like, my... That's how I came to love this work because business is stories and it's personal stories. And I will go even further than that. There's an amazing businessman in the US called Jack Stack who wrote a yes. book called The Great Game of Business with a very good friend of mine, Bo Burlingham. And Jack has become a friend over the last, I don't know, 10, 12 years. And Jack told me very early on in our friendship, he said, you know, accounts, the individual accounts, they are the manifestation of habits. If you look at expense accounts or investment accounts or any accounts, and if you take a balance sheet down and strip it down to its lowest denominator, the individual numbered account, you will see transactions. And those transactions are habits. They're just habits. You know, how people spend money is they're making a choice. And as they do it over time, it becomes a habit. And those habits become characteristics or character traits of the business. So you look at the accounts, you can read off what the habits and the character of the organization are. So everywhere you look, the numbers are just telling us or giving us clues to human characteristics and traits. And in some, they're a story. And I love stories. I'm fascinated. So there's so many things here that you're sharing what really comes to mind, though, is that you, we had a previous episode where you commented, it was when we had Danielle and Lindsay from Kickstart Accounting, and we started talking about money mindset and how that ties back to our childhood experience and things we learn in childhood. What you're describing that shows up on our balance sheet is the compilation of habits, the results of habits over time, underneath those habits are beliefs and mindsets. That's what drives those habits. Yeah, and I think it was you that said in that interview, show me how someone deals with money and I'll show you how they deal with life. Yes, money cuts to the chase of who we are. Yeah, it does. And there's a book that's come out fairly recently and I'll be able to find you the title. I, it's called, Money is Not the Problem, You Are. <laughs> And it's absolutely true. Money is energy. Money is just is something we've created to make exchange between people easier. There's an economic sort of aspect to it, of course, but it's just energy because for itself, it's worth, it doesn't mean anything. You can do Donald Duck's Uncle Scrooge, I think it was, can, you can swim in it, but it's very uncomfortable. <laughs> but its only value is as energy in transacting. So if it's energy, then how we deal with it, how we move it, is entirely personal. It's entirely, it's unique to us and our energy. So on a metaphysical level, money is, will only ever do what we do. It only will resonate with us in one form or another. And understanding that and getting on top of it means getting on top of yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So... You have a lot of experience dealing with entrepreneurs, small yes. business. Tell us a little bit about your experience that led you to develop what you are most curious about now. And then I want to hear more about that. The thing that I noticed most quickly when dealing with entrepreneurs is this vast chasm between their knowledge as operators and their financial knowledge, their financial acumen. And I've always seen myself as a somewhat either a, a Sherpa 
sort of leading people through the world of finance because I can say to them, this, I'm a poet. If I get it, <laughs> if I get it you can get it. <laughs> I love that. If I'm a poet and I can get it, you can. If I can, get, if I can get it, you can get it. We just have to reframe it so that it makes sense in your context because finance is like medicine. You know, there's, People don't have white coats, but they've created this secret language. You know, they're high priests, and they have this secret language. It's like sort of modern Latin that has one purpose and one purpose only, and that's to keep the ignorant ignorant, to make sure that, and all castes do this, all societies have special knowledge areas, and they use that knowledge to extract power and effectively value. Yeah? In the olden days, the priests spoke Latin, and only a very small number of people were educated in speaking Latin, so that there would be a reason for them to exist, because of course God spoke Latin, didn't he? <laughs> um, so the language of accounting is... The language of accounting is Latin. It's the Latin equivalent, and you need priests to translate it, and they alone can talk to God or the IRS. <laughs> and... and <laughs> And you have to humbly submit and put your coins in the pocket as when you go to, and look at the accounting companies, Deloitte's headquarters. These are church, these are temples today with all these priests in them who are telling you how complicated the world is. And I think that's really the beauty of systems like Profit First, because it takes something that previously looked so complex, makes it utterly simple, and you have something that you teach, which is how to calculate a share price for a business. Yeah. And it's not an end in itself, although it could be. I've spent ages trying to figure out how do I get people interested enough to want to open the door to more knowledge themselves? How do I get that curiosity that otherwise they just say, that's not an area for me. How often do I hear people say, I'm no good at math, so I don't really understand accounting, or it's just too complicated for me. Women particularly, women mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, it's not for me. I don't like thinking about money in those terms. I just had a connection, okay? So it's like you have written this really good novel, and you know, once somebody's reading it, they're going to be totally engrossed in it. But it has a terrible introduction. The introduction's in Aramaic. Yeah, yeah, and it's written in gap accounting language. And, you know, you've got to get through that before you can get to the really good, juicy parts of this novel. And what you're doing with teaching us to calculate our share price is you're writing a really sexy introduction to this novel. Yeah, I'm making it as easy as possible to get to stage one because I'm absolutely convinced that if you get to stage one, and you can do it yourself, and you suddenly have this living number in your hand, and it's easy to calculate, and it takes you three minutes to do it. The moment that you have understood it, and then say to yourself, on the first of the month, I wonder where that number is now. So that you, instead of waiting for the number to come to you, or some numbers to come to you, you actively go and say, what, how do I want the three numbers that will allow me to calculate my share price for this month? Because something magic happens when you've done it three times. And the, three, the magic that happens is you need three times because three times you have, the numbers will do one of three things. They will go up, they will go down, or they go sideways. And either way, or any of those three options, will provoke an emotional response from the entrepreneur. If it's going up, he'll want it to keep going up. If it's going down, he'll want it to stop going down. And if it goes sideways, he wants it to go up. Yeah, and make sure of it course. Right. Yeah. So we all want it to go up. Sideways is boring, so it has to go up. Up is great, but I want more. And down is horrible. So and that's, it's the only three things that can happen when you've got three numbers. So that's um, the hook. It's the only option with two numbers. It's, you've got a line. Once you've got two dots, you can join them and there's a line. And once that happens because it's your number it's not an abstract number it's not ibm's share price it's not it's yours you own it the moment that you've calculated you own it 
And then that share price starts talking to you. That number starts talking to you and you start a conversation with it. You're interested in it. It's a score. You want, we all like to win. You know, we're entrepreneurs and we like winning for all sorts of different reasons, but we like winning. We're not doing this to lose, we're doing it to win. So if that's the score, then I suddenly have one number that is keeping the ultimate score from it. Because at the end of the day, every other number, every other KPI ever produced in a business ties back into that. Into the share price. Into the share price. It's the ultimate number. It doesn't tell you as much as individual smaller numbers might, inventory turnover, return on equity, yield, margin, doesn't tell you as much that you can operate with, but it's the aggregate of all of those. And there's a reason that for 56 years, Warren Buffett, the very first page of his annual report for Berkshire Hathaway, every year publishes three numbers, every year, next to the date. It's the change in book value, the change in the share price, the annual change in the share price, and the annual change in the S&P 500. Those are three numbers he publishes every year. Why? Because, he says, the book value change is the only one that I can affect. I can't affect the S&P 500, nor can I affect how people trade my share. But I can work on my share price, my book value which is effectively what your share price is. So the change in book value is the change in the balance sheet value of the equity, net value of the equity, which is the result of all the other changes in the balance sheet, profit and write-offs and changes in assets. All those decisions that we make, they're reflected in that share price. It's in there, in the book value change. And Buffett says the number itself is not that important, taken by itself. But over time the change in book value will give you a very good indication of the change in intrinsic value. And the change in intrinsic value is what you're aiming for as an owner, because that's the value that you're creating in the business. So the amazing thing is that this book value share price, which is used by the best investor in the world, and there is no doubt that Warren Buffett in his 50 year career, 60 year career is without doubt the most disciplined successful, transparent investor on the planet. There's nobody who has achieved anything like his success over that time. And it's the time, not the size that matters. It's the constancy of his discipline. His habit. His habit that makes him the ultimate model, not for the size of his wealth, that's irrelevant, but for the mindset that he's created and for the focus or the narrowness of his understanding of what his job as a businessman is. He's the ultimate clock worker. He has figured out in his person how to maximize the leverage of his own personal activity. And he's cut everything else out. And if you look at your four week vacationers, you are putting them on the first step to doing what Buffett has done automatically in his life, which is to reduce the operational reliance of the business on you so that you can do what you do best. And Buffett has shown that if you do what you do best at the very pinnacle of business activity, then, and you do it constantly over 56 years, this is what can come out of it. So that is the habit. That's the habit. It's the discipline of focusing your activities as a business owner on the one activity that only you can do, only you. Nobody else can do it in the business. And that is to strategically manage the balance sheet, making the bets that will then result in value being created. Strategically manage the balance sheet. That's the one thing as the owners need to be doing. It's the only thing that only you can do. Everything else somebody else can do. Wow. So tell me, you said intrinsic value. Yep. Why should we care about intrinsic value? What is intrinsic value? What does that mean? Unpack that term for us. Okay. There's a technical term, a mathematical term. Intrinsic value is the sum of all the future cash flows that the business will produce discounted to the present day minus the liabilities. So all the money that the business is ever going to make discounted to the present using 
a discount rate, that's where it suddenly becomes art and not science because you can make that up. And the bigger it is, the less that number is going to be. But let's just assume that you take a, a reasonable one, 8%, 7%, whatever it is, discount it to the future, or discount all those future earnings back to the present. So you get a lump sum of all the future earnings today, take away all the debt of the business today, and you end up with a net amount. And that net amount is the intrinsic value of the business. That's the mathematical version, or the financial mathematical version. The other version is what, it's the value of the business that somebody else would be prepared to pay for it today. And in their head, they will be doing that calculation. And they will be taking into account not just the numbers, but how well organized the business is, how transparent it is. They will be taking into account things like its reputation, the diversity of its client base, the focus of its operations, the, the knowledge of its staff, the training manuals, the, the marketing, the experience, all of those things, all the intangible aspects that are not captured in the balance sheet that go to make up the real value of the business, all the stuff that you as an entrepreneur, that very intricate carpet that you've been weaving with all your networks and with all your telephone calls and with all your service and with everything that you do, you're weaving this tapestry around your balance sheet, which is what you can see, but all the other stuff is what somebody else can see and will pay for. So that's why you're doing it. And the reason that you need your share price is that all that stuff is not, you can't measure it very well on a day-to-day -day basis, but your book value will give you an indication in, its, in the line of its development as to how you're getting on with that. So if, you, if you're compounding away at, I don't know, 10, 12% in your book value, you can be sure that your intrinsic value will be compounding away at roughly the same rate. So I'm gonna put this in my very simple terms and I wanna just check this out and make sure I'm tracking. Am I being priestly? Am I speaking no, Latin? No, but I wanna just make sure we get it straight into okay. plain English here. If I am building up my share price and it's going up and up and up in my business, that is a strong indicator that the intrinsic value of my business is going up and up and up. At least the same rate. At, at least the same rate. And at the point in time when I decide to sell my business, I have done years of work to build that value. Yep. That's going to increase the sale price of business. And you don't know whether your intrinsic value is 10, 15, or 50, or maybe 100% above your book value. You, there are ways of figuring it out. Mm -hmm. I won't go into those now, but, you, but over time, because that intrinsic value is moving in the same direction as your book value, you will know whatever the distance between book value and intrinsic value is, it will have moved in the same proportion, in the same direction. And that's what you're trying to do as a business owner. That gets me very excited. That gets me very curious. That gets me wanting to get up and work on this every single day and hold it in my head. Like what is my share price and what am I doing to drive that up? And because there's one gateway that you need to go through as a business owner, and it sounds really stupid, but your business has to be in a position to actually produce those numbers to start with. And where I found and the biggest shock for me was finding how many businesses can't even produce those numbers in a timely way. Yeah. And so for anybody who, that's okay, that just means you have to start a little bit further back. Right. You know, and we encounter that when we do a profit assessment for clients. Many of the folks that we do profit assessments with, they need to do some cleanup in their bookkeeping just to be able to give us the basic information. But that in and of itself is the starting point. We all have to start somewhere. And if there's cleanup to be done, so be it. And the amazing thing that happens when you've understood just that very basic request for numbers is that once you as an owner start asking your business to produce those numbers for you, whoever is responsible for doing them, then you are suddenly, you're making the first step to being an investor in your own business. And that first step is absolutely crucial. You getting angry, the business isn't producing the numbers so that you can calculate the simplest of numbers in a timely fashion. 
is the beginning of your starting to think like an investor. Good. So that anger, that frustration that we feel when we can't see those numbers or we can't find them or get our hands on it, we're supposed to feel that. And that's a good sign because we're becoming an investor in our business. The, the really important thing to understand is that every entrepreneur has two major roles. One of them is the doer, the guy who's doing the stuff, who's ringing the clients, who's, who is responsible for delivering the value proposition. He's the guy who, or the woman who's organizing everything so that the clients get what they're paying for. And his role is all consuming. And because it's so big, tucked away behind that role is the role of investor, which gets absolutely no attention whatsoever. Mm. Because in an argument between the investor and the owner, and then the manager, the doer, if let's say the business needs cash, because the manager says, I have to pay wages. I've got payroll on Monday. What he's doing when he's worrying about it over the weekend, he's having a conversation with his inner investor as to whether to put 15,000 bucks into the company on Monday so we can meet payroll from his right. savings. Right. He is making an investment decision. Guess who always wins that argument? The manager. <laughs> always. <laughs> always. Because those roles aren't clearly defined. And the investor has no place and no, there's no discipline other than possibly guilt or worry or no money or something. So if you start on this path, what you're doing is you're acknowledging the role of investor. You're saying, I want these numbers because this is my most important investment. And the moment you do that, you are giving a tiny little bit of space to the investor you also are in your business. And building that space and building that role is going to be your most important job because the joy of it is, if you really do that well, then when the point comes for you to say, I'm gonna hand over operations, the doing bit to somebody else so I can concentrate on being the best owner that I can be, then you've reached that magic place where you can go on an eight week vacation or you completely change your life because you're always on vacation because you are not caught by your business in an operational role anymore. There are some people who are, who are fine not creating any intrinsic value because they love doing what they're doing and then they can't imagine not doing it, but that is finite because at some stage in your life, you will have to stop doing it. What I find is there's the hope that at some point, if I do enough of the doing, at some point when I sell the business, there will be value there. Does and that is a fruition. huge fallacy. Yes. Because if you have not transitioned out of your doing role, the business will collapse if once you take yourself out of it. And there's nothing to sell. So as you were talking, I also had this aha moment. Investor is not on that role chart. For a business. When you no. look at an organizational chart, there is no role for investor. We need to make a new work chart, Stephen. There's, <laughs> the investor is above the owner. Yeah. It's there in the org chart, but it's tucked behind the CEO. You can't see it. You need to move it up. Move it up and elevate it and have a real role there. Yep. Because, and that's it. When we send our four week vacationers on their four week vacation and they come back, there's this sense of, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with myself. They're supposed to be the investor now. Yeah, people don't know what to do. And I say to them, okay, Whoa, you've got 365 days in a year. Let's just give, what's the minimum that you're prepared to give your investor? Shall we say it's 1%? And they say, yeah, 1%. So I say, okay, 1% is. 365 days, that's 3.65 days is 1%, which is, let's round it up to four. Four days is one day a quarter. So one day a quarter, you are not going to do any operational doing stuff. You are just going to be an investor. Most people say, well, what do I do? What do I do on one day that I'm just an investor? And that's what you need to figure out. You need to look at your balance sheet. You need to look at returns on equity. You need to look at the risk in your business. You need to look at your investment. What's my investment worth? 
in my business. I need to have people reporting to me. I need to make sure that processes are in place to satisfy my requirements as an investor because on that day, I want my numbers. I don't want to be scurrying around for eight of the nine hours that I've given myself trying to figure out where my numbers are. I want somebody to present those to me. And once I start demanding certain services from my business and its advisors, for me as an investor, then I'm starting to take responsibility. Okay. So I'm getting excited about this because there are so many good things here. One of the things that has really piqued my curiosity ever since you shared it with the Prevenda strategists, you showed us a chart and you showed us cross industry, Mm -hmm. how some small businesses, a tiny, tiny fraction of small businesses outperform their industry peers? By factors of seven to 10. I want you to tell us about that chart and then I want you to unpack a little bit underneath that. And I know I have to do a hard stop, but this is worthwhile. I cannot deprive our profit designers of this. (laughs) This is a study done for small, medium-sized enterprises in Europe, but I validated the results with friends in the States and in the UK. And the numbers, they're the same in every advanced economy. They're the same. And what it shows is that the top 10% of companies in every single industry group, the top 10% outperform on an EBIT basis, outperform the rest, average of all the others, by a factor of seven and a half in aggregate. So let's say the average for metal bending companies is two and a half percent EBIT, then the top 10% will be making 15 to 18% EBIT returns. Okay. So the value they're creating for their customers and the way that they're organized is such that they are making five to seven to 10 times most interesting ones are management consultants. You know, the people who actually are supposed to know because they're advising, they have the biggest gap. The average for most management consultants in the industry grouping was something like one and a half percent EBIT. And the best were doing 35. Whoa. So the best really know what they're doing and they practice what they preach. The best really know what they're doing. They really, and if you look at the numbers, it, they're saying something dramatic the average return across all companies in the study that I looked at, and it's one of the most exhaustive um, that's ever been done, the average was 2.7% EBIT across all industries. And the average of the top 10% was 17.5, okay? Now, the average included those, that 17 point, that top 10%. So if the contribution of the top 10% was 1.75 to a total average of 2.7. So if you take 1.7 away from 2.7, you get 1%. That means 90% of all the businesses had to make do with the 1% average. And if you imagine that the next 25% after the top 10 were probably having all of that, that means that two thirds of businesses were making nothing on average because the bottom lot were losing money and the middle lot were probably just about breaking even. So the returns in many industry are grouped at the people who are performing best. And I have a conclusion to make from that or to take from that. Number one, you don't have to do very much better to get extraordinary results above average results. So the returns to competence, that's what I've called it, are huge. And they're nowhere greater than in the small business area. Because most people are doing it badly, they've got no training, they don't understand processes, it's all person-centered, hugely inefficient. They don't get any, they have very little productivity gains from year to year. So they're always struggling, just below the waterline. If you can improve on that a bit by doing profit first, clock working your business, and pumpkin planning your business. Just concentrate on doing those three things, starting with pumpkin plan, then going on to profit first, the strategy first, then capturing the value from that strategy, 
and then automating your business to run. If you can do that in a programmatic way, you will move up your competence and catapult your returns into the top third, maybe even the top 10%. The better you get it, and this is the really interesting thing, when owners of these businesses were asked, what's the reason those guys in the top 10% are doing so well? They say, well, the most common response was, well, it's an unfair comparison because they're focused. Oh, they're focused. Oh, my goodness. They're, yeah, they're special, well, the word they would use was they're specialized on a certain segment. So it's not re- uh... you can't compare it to us. And my question was then, what's stopping you from focusing? Yes. Yes. I usually got thrown out at that stage. Because the, no, and, I don't think our profit designers are going to throw you out. I think their ears are perking up because they're recognizing they've, they've been learning the things to do. In the perception of the people who are average and below average, the comparison with the people who are doing really well wasn't really a fair one or well, because they're specialists. Yeah. yeah. And it never occurred to them to say the reason that they are doing so well is because they've chosen to specialize. They weren't born specialized. They evolved into specialists. And guess what? As a specialist, you're creating more value for a very specific group of customers. You get better and better at doing that, deeper and deeper into it. You're creating more and more value. And that shows up in your returns, which then shows up in your balance sheet, which then shows up in your intrinsic value. It's not that complicated. Just have to, what Jack Stack says, you've got to want it. Yeah. So pumpkin plan first. Put the strategy and get very focused on the area where you can serve the top clients from your unique strengths and talents of the business and yourself as the owner, and then systemize around yep. that. And That's- then put profit first in place. And then, of course, you have to have all the team, right? So how to hire the best comes in there. Absolutely. And then you have to take a four week vacation because that's where we start to separate out the doing and get into the investor mode. And what happens on a four week vacation? And this is, you're going to love this segue because we can finish on this because we started talking about butterflies. Yes. Small business owners are caterpillars because they're munching away all the time and either they die as caterpillars or they go into a four-week vacation chrysalis and they emerge as investor butterflies. I love it. The investor butterflies. <laughs> well, and, but that's it. That's exactly it. The four-week vacation is your cocooning time for yes. you to reflect on your role in the business. That's what you need to do. Yes. And if you're enjoying being away from your business and you come back and you notice that it hasn't disappeared or collapsed in chaos because you've done your homework properly and you've enjoyed that, then all I can say to you is hang on to that joy and do whatever you can to increase the amount of time that you can treat yourself to that joy of owning a business and not having to do all the caterpillar grunt in it. I love it. So fourweekvacation.com, folks, that's where you can go to learn about the upcoming retreat. And I want to share with you that Sir Stephen Wilkinson is our VIP speaker for the retreat. So every time we do a retreat, we kick it off with a VIP day ahead of the retreat. And Sir Stephen is our honored guest who's going to join us. And we're going to learn how to be investors at the Four Week Vacation Legacy Retreat. Investor butterflies, from caterpillar to butterfly. From caterpillar to butterfly. You heard it here first. <laughs> so, and I know, Sir Stephen, you are also working on a U.S.-based offering. You've de- you're developing an offering that you have rolled out now in Germany that you've yeah. piloted. And so take a few minutes here and just tell us about what that is. Okay. This is a course that we've designed to codify this whole idea of calculating your stock price. It's a 10 part course where we effectively would, I take you through the various stages of calculating your stock price and then what you can do with it in order to build out your role as investor over a 10 week period. And we'll be recording it so you can whenever you want, but I would love to do a pilot course with us based in entrepreneurs just to, get a feel for what they really need and how they would like to me to adapt 
this knowledge so that it works best for them and their circumstances. Yeah. yeah. So I want to share with our profit designers that you all would be great for helping Sir Stephen pilot this course. And one of the things that's really cool when you're part of a pilot of an offering like this is you get in at a really good, super reasonable investment for the course. Yep. And that has yet to be determined, but I know I, Sir Stephen and I have been back and forth on this. And I know he has that in mind that getting in on the ground level is going to serve you well. You get to help shape the offering and you learn a lot. And I hope that I get to be a part of this too, Sir Stephen, because I'm, I'm very intrigued. Brilliant. It's not quite raw because we've already done it once and the structure is there and I know it works, but the pricing will be as if it was the first time. Wow. That's phenomenal. So for those of us who want to get on your list as you're developing this so that we're first to know, where's the best place to go? Just Stephen at goodandprosper.com or on the website goodandprosper.com. Okay. Sign up okay. and we'll be closing it. I haven't decided yet, but if we get maybe 15 people on the course, then we'll probably close it. I want to have an intimate conversation with everybody who's joining that course to make sure that we really can tailor it to the specific needs of a U.S. business audience. The feedback that I've got so far is that this would be interesting. It's piqued curiosity, and I really look forward to doing it with I, you and your profit designers. And this has absolutely. been a lot of fun. Yes, I have thoroughly enjoyed having you with us. I can't wait to have you with us here at Breakthroughs on the Bayou. I can't wait to March. Come. This is going to be so fun. Thank, Thank you, you so Steven. much. Take care. You too. Bye. This episode of the Profit by Design podcast has been brought to you by Tap the Potential, the home of How to Hire the Best, and the four-week vacation. Don't forget, month of June, mention I want a vacation, and you'll save $3,000 off your early bird registration for the four-week vacation legacy breakthroughs on the Bayou Retreat happening March 2020. Check us out, fourweekvacation.com. Thank you for spending time with us today. Join our conversation in the Profit by Design podcast Facebook group. Share your thoughts on today's episode, ask us questions, and let us know what you want to hear about next. Visit our website at ProfitByDesignPodcast.com to access resources from our sponsors and tools we've created for you. Subscribe to the show on whatever platform you're listening to right now. There's a subscribe button right there. Go ahead and hit it so that you always get a notification when we release a new episode. And finally, share our podcast with a friend if you know a friend who would enjoy it. Thanks again for listening. This is real life business. Keep your chin up. Keep moving forward. You got this. <laughs>